I did a video a few months ago on Pat Nayak's theory of contemporary imperialism and this is a video dealing with one paper of hers which estimates the degree of exploitation of India by the British Empire and explains the mechanism by which it was obtained. Now the big or controversial issue here is whether the exploitation occurred via dividends or by tribute. And dividends are revenue obtained within the capitalist economy, basically surplus value from the exploitation of wage labour. Tribute's an older form of exploitation extracted by state power as taxes or perhaps disguised as rent from a pre-capitalist rural population. In the classic Marxist-Leninist account of imperialism, dividends are seen as the main form of exploitation by which surplus is transferred from the colonies to the metropolis. But a tradition of Indian writers, starting with Nauroji, emphasise tribute as the main form of British imperial exploitation of India. Nehruji was the first Indian member of parliament in the London parliament and he wrote extensively in the 19th century on how Britain exploited India via the tax system. The Leninist theory of imperial exploitation drew heavily on a different uh, British writer or British Empire writer Hobson, who was a liberal anti-imperialist who would oppose the Boer War and wrote a book on imperialism. And Lenin relied heavily on Hobson. And as far as I can determine, Lenin had never read Nehruji, um, or and pay, certainly pays no attention to Nehruji's account of how exploitation occurred. Pat Utsapatniak is a left-wing Indian economist who has written extensively on imperialism, agrarian relations, food security, etc. And she has revived the work of Nehruji and his early followers. And in this uh, talk, I'm going to be looking at a paper by her, which is called revisiting the drain or transfers from India to Britain in the context of the global diffusion of capitalism and this is a an attempt by her to estimate the degree of exploitation there was. Now what's the mechanism she outlines? Well the first step is that the colonial government levied taxes on the peasants and this colonial government might either be the imperial government or at an earlier stage the commercial company the British East India Company which had gained control of the tax system over large areas of India. The administration whether it is the East India Company or the Crown then spends about 75% of the taxes in India on administration, military forces that needs to hold the country down, etc. and remits maybe 25 to 30% to London. Nominally for services provided by the metropolis, but according to Patnick, this is largely an accounting slate of hand. Um, the government in London invented services which it was supposedly providing. Some of these were real expenditure, others were uh, fictional and in, at times uh, India, the government of India was making gifts to, to the government of Britain. The money in London was then used to buy imports of crops grown by Indian peasants. This was 
most evident when it was a commercial company. And the money returns to the peasants via normal commercial channels. And this then provides the revenue to meet next year's taxes. The net effect was that the peasants were providing the metropolis with crops for nothing. In, at one level, this is what all states in the pre-capitalist period or all empires did. They all levied taxes and the peasants supported the empire for free. Only in some of these states was the tax in monetary form. And the advantage to the state of providing the tax in monetary form is that it disguises what is really happening, which is an appropriation of the crops for nothing. It separates it because the tax collector is a different person from the merchant who purchased the crops from the, um, from the peasant. Now, Lenin misses out this mechanism, and it is a significant economic mechanism. And let's look at the flows that Lenin and Hobson do mention and compare them with the current estimates of what those flows were and uh, Utsapatnaik's own figures. This is a passage from Lenin's imperialism where he's quoting Hobson. Aggressive imperialism, says Hobson further on, which costs the taxpayer so dear, which is of little value to the manufacturer and trader, is a source of great gain to the investor. The annual income of Great Britain, sorry, the annual income that Great Britain derives from commissions on her whole foreign and colonial trade import and export is estimated by Sir R. Griffin at 18 million in, for 1899, which he takes as 2.5% on a turnover of 800 million. Great as this sum is, it can't explain the aggressive imperialism of Great Britain, which is explained by the income of 90 to 100 million from invested capital, the income of rentiers. The income of rentiers is five times greater than the income obtained from foreign trade of the biggest trading company in the world. This is the essence of imperialism and imperialist parasitism, i.e. that is what he's saying is the key factor. Dividend income. And the 90 to 100 million figure comes from Hobson. This whole passage from Lenin is a mixture of quotation from uh, Hobson and abbreviation of what Hobson actually says. So the, the parts which are not in quotation marks are actually abbreviations of a passage from Hobson. So I went to check this against current estimates uh, using the very useful database which the Bank of England publishes, a millennium of economic data. And it's difficult to get exactly the same things for commissions on trade. Hobson was saying though these were 18 million. The Bank of England estimates what it calls invisible trade. That's saying not trade in, in commodities or physical commodities to be 60 million in that year. Um, the invisible trade is typically taken to be commissions on re-export perhaps, uh, shipping charges, insurance on shipping, um, things like that. Now, and general insurance, insurance on um, houses, factories, etc. in other countries. The shipping stuff is not all surplus because sailors' wages would have been included in the shipping. On dividends, Hobson's estimate seems 
pretty spot on. The Bank of England says it was 103 million in in uh, 1899. Hobson reckoned it was between 90 and 100 million. So he, there doesn't seem much uh, dispute on that. Using this, um, the Bank of England figures shows that the dividends covered a net trade deficit that Britain had of 71 million. Now this is an interesting point about the 19th century. A lot of the German and Russian debate about imperialism focused on the alleged difficulty of realization of the surplus and the need to export surplus value to achieve this. If you look at British figures for the 19th century, it's clear that Britain was a net consumer of surplus value. Insofar as Britain exported, or could be said to export capital, it wasn't a net exporter of capital. It was reinvesting abroad some of the dividend income that came into London. But a large part of that dividend income was used to support the imports of the upper classes of luxury products. So the, of the 100 million dividends, 71 million went to cover a trade deficit, excess imports over my, excess imports from the rest of the world relative to the exports of manufactured goods and coal etc that Britain produced and that left 29 million on current account for what would appear as capital export but it was just recycling of dividends of surplus value that was produced abroad back abroad. Now Patnaik's figures focus on tax revenues extracted from the Indian peasantry and remitted to the colonial government. But, sorry, by the colonial government from Calcutta to London. From 1899 to 1901, she estimates this was running at about 17 million a year. And this is of the same order as Hobson's estimate of commissions on trade, but that's a, uh, a coincidence. And that's only 17% of dividend income. So it's much less than dividend income. So. Lenin is right to lay the emphasis on dividend income as being more significant. It was a lot greater than the amount that Patnaik estimates were coming in as tribute. But on the other hand, the tribute is significant when compared to the current account surplus of 29 million. And part of her argument is that the tribute contributed to the ability of the British ruling class to accumulate capital holdings abroad. So who did the money go to? Before 1858, a private company, the East India Company, controlled large areas of India and had acquired the position of being able to levy taxes. It, in a sense, put a private company in the position where feudal rulers had once been. It appropriated the feudal rulers' surplus. And these taxes were then used to purchase crops in India, which were exported to Britain, and the proceeds from the sale of these crops could be paid out as dividends to the shareholders of the company. And it's clear that up until 1858, the rentier class was the direct beneficiary of the tribute levied on the Indian subcontinent. After 1858, the East India Company was nationalised. For a period up until 1873, dividends continued to be paid to the shareholders out of Indian taxes, even though India was now a crown territory. After 1873, 
the East India Company was wound up and the shareholders no longer got dividends. So direct income to the rentier class stopped from tribute. From 1876, the British Empire in India was formally declared and the Queen became the Empress. So formally, any revenues that accrued from India to London accrued to the Crown via the India Office, which was one of the five branches of the British government, along with the Foreign Office, Colonial Office, Home Office and the War Office. In practice, after 1858, the surplus was being used to finance the expansion of the empire. In particular, it financed expansion in Africa and Arabia. The cost of British forces in Africa and Arabia and the wars to conquer, conquer these areas were charges on the colonial government of India. This would be justified by the British Empire on the grounds that these conquests were necessary to secure the passage to India. So taxes levied on Indian farmers then paid for the conquest of South and East Africa, bases in Aden, bases in the Gulf, and paid for the British invasion of Mesopotamia in the First World War. And this is unproductive expenditure, not capital expenditure. This is not accumulation. But the unproductive expenditure would otherwise have had to have been met out of taxes on the property classes in Britain. Though, had there not been an empire in India, the, the ruling class would have had no interest in securing these routes, probably. In summary, Patnaik brings to our attention, which is a major financial and economic aspect of British imperialism, which is ignored by most Marxist analysis. And she shows the historical importance of tribute as a form of surplus extraction. But there are some problems with her analysis as well. The weaknesses that I find are some of the weaknesses are, are relatively technical economic matters and I'm not going to go into them here. I think she has a relatively inconsistent treatment of the financial mechanisms by which the transfers occurs. Um, she claims that by taking the total of what are called council bills, she can get the total of the export surplus of India. Whereas earlier she had said all experts sports have to go through the council bill mechanism so that would be that strikes me as inconsistent and I think there is an inconsistent treatment of her attempt to use the Keynesian multiplier in her analysis but these are technical economic issues more to the point is her attempt to construct a populist propaganda message from her analysis and this is political and it basically reflects a deeply anti-Marxian standpoint for, for this left economist. Basically, it's a left Keynesian, not a Marxian position. And I'll look at this in some more detail. Her analysis is fine so long as it relies on the best available historical data, leaving aside quibbles about um, the council bills mechanism. The historical data gives date, gives money quantities in either pounds or rupees. Now the rupee was, in the 19th century, a sil both India and Britain had, sil had precious metal currency, except that India was on silver standard, Britain was on gold standard, and the rupee was a silver coin of 11.66 grams, and the pound was a gold coin of 7.98 grams. And the exchange rate between the pound and the rupee fluctuated with changes in the relative values of gold and silver. Because this is the classic um, metallic money system that Marx describes in Capital. 
The problem comes when Patnaik tries to express, say, 1898 or 1839 values in contemporary 2017 pounds since she publishes her book in 2017, uh, article in 2017. Now, how do you compare money at two different time intervals? You can't really because there is no trading between two different time intervals. Concept of exchange value is only meaningful in the context of actual exchanges taking place. And obviously, without time machines, there's no intertemporal tra trade. But there are broadly three approaches a Marxist economist could take to get a, a grip on this. The simplest is to do what Marx does and express all prices in precious metal in the start year and go back from metal to currency in the finish year. No problem, so if you're always on the gold standard, the metal provides a standard measure of value. And that was why gold was used, because it had a highly stable intertemporal value in terms of labour time. An alternative method is to adjust for purchasing power changes using cost of living indices. Or that's, that's what is most commonly done. So it, it, it measures how many goods you could buy at a given point in time with a certain amount of money. The problem with that is that there is no 1899 price for an iPhone 3 and horses might be a major commodity on sale in 1899 but they're not now. The, the, the commodities on sale change over time so over a long period these, this becomes an unreliable indices. The only things which you can reliably keep in it are very basic foodstuffs. An alternative to that is to convert money, money quantities into labour using the monetary equivalent of labour time so that you get not a money amount as your invariable stat, not gold as your invariable standard of value, but labour as the invariable standard of value. Now, the second and third ones are difficult to do. In principle, you can do the third one. You could get estimates of um, the monetary equivalent of labour, very rough estimates of the monetary equivalent of labour in India or Britain in 1899. If you had reasonably reliable statistics on working hours in these countries, um, the share of the... it becomes particularly difficult in a country like India where a substantial part of the physical product of agriculture is directly consumed without becoming a commodity um, in those days. So. It, it would be pretty difficult to do it for India. For Britain it w wouldn't be too hard because we've got good statistics on working hours. Now I'm going to apply the first method to, to working out the current value of the um, currency drain from India to Britain. And I'm using silver since India had a silver currency. My calculations here take her figures for the number of rupees which she estimates were transferred from Britain to India by the colonial government over that period. Now we know what a weight a rupee is, just over 11 grams. So we can estimate how much silver equivalent was exported from India. And it's a huge amount. It's about 64,000 tonnes of silver equivalent, if it had actually been shipped to silver. And we can then look at the 
what would 64,000 tonnes of silver be worth now? So we look at the, the current price, of the, or not now, 2017. So we look at the highest price that silver had in 2017, which was um, 54, 58 US cents per gram. And we can convert that into pounds. So what that conversion does, based on metallic currency, is estimate that it would be 28 billion pounds, which is obviously a large sum of money, because 64,000 tons of silver is a hell of a lot of silver. Obviously, the actual silver wasn't exported. The transfers were done via a combination of the private banking system and the, the state currency boards. But this is not what Pat Knight does. She adopts, without any theoretical justification, the most banal bourgeois approach imaginable. She starts out with five million, five billion rupees, and she then says, compounded at a low 5% interest for 112 years since 1905, this sum is 1,302 billion rupees, or 86 billion pounds. There's so much wrong in this calculation, I scarcely know where to start. Firstly, she gets the wrong exchange rate. In 2017, the rupee to pound exchange rate was one rupee was worth 0.012 pounds. So, um, 1,302 billion rupees was actually 15.6 billion pounds. So she's got a, she's out by 70 billion in her calculation there. How was her method supposed to work? Why is compound interest supposed to be a sensible thing to apply? It just rests on the illusion which is standard in bourgeois economics, that capital just grows naturally. And it's a lo an illusion supported by what would happen if you deposited money in the bank. But Marx uncovered what happens behind the scenes. Interest is paid out of surplus value, which comes from surplus labour. There is no spontaneous growth of capital. So what, what it amounts to, and she at various points says the Indian interest rate has typically been more than 5%, so she's being very generous on this. Um, it amounts to saying she's working out what would have happened had 5 billion rupees been deposited in a Bombay bank in 1905. And this would indeed, supposing the banks remain solvent, would give you 1.3 billion in 2017. But on the other hand, if she had sim if some if the capitalist who deposited these uh, five billion in 1905 had simply buried it in the ground or put it in a vault and opened the vault in 2017, then the weight of silver coins then would have been worth twice that number of rupees. It would be worth two thousand three hundred fifty-two billion because the rupee has gone undergone such inflation that 5% interest is not enough to preserve the value that you stand out with. But it's, it's still unclear. I mean, this is an absurd suggestion that you could have um, deposited the money in a bank in, in Bombay and got the increase like that. She doesn't justify it in any way, but that's the implicit idea of applying compound interest to a sum of rupees. So how does she get to her 86 billion? Because that wouldn't have done it. Suppose she put it in a London bank. Suppose you took 64,000 tons of silver, converted it to gold coin. In the early 20th century, 40 to 1 gold to silver ratio. That would give you 201 million in 
gold coins which you could deposit at a London bank. Applying 5% interest, that would give you 47 billion in 2017. It's still only half of what she claims. So it's unclear how she gets her estimate. Well, it wasn't even the correct way of applying compound interest. What she did is she took the total for 16 years and then applied compound interest from the middle year, assuming it was all available and deposited in the middle year. Now, that's not the correct way to apply compound interest on an in income stream. You have to apply it year by year. You have to assume that the stream is invested each year and then you deposit it in the London Bank in 1899, in, in um, 1900 etc 17 million or how, however much each year by taking 1906 as a base year she took the one year when the gold price ratio was at its lowest 30 to 1 which would boost her her 2017 estimate but still only boosts it to 16 billion and I've been unable to work out how on earth she gets her 86 billion figure Suppose we ignore these um, errors in exchange rates, etc. And suppose you could deposit sufficient money in a London bank for it to grow at eighty, grow to eighty-six billion over that period. And this is about sixty billion more than the silver would have been worth if it had been just stored underground and dug up again. So where do these extra 60 billion that she claims are part of the value of the tribute come from? Well, obviously, they could only come from interest charged by the London Bank on it to its borrowers. Some of these borrowers would be in Britain, some in the USA. Uh, maybe they lent to, to, to the French or Russian governments, etc. And how did the borrowing firms or governments get their interest? by exploiting the workers in other countries. So the increase in value that she's claiming could only have been achievable through exploitation which occurred outside of India. So she, it is an entirely mythical calculation on her part, but her mythical calculation is adding in exploitation which would have occurred outside of India. The nonsense gets worse as she projects it further back in time. She applies her method of, of taking a mid-year to several separate historical periods and applies 5% interest to them in all cases. Now, most of the inflation of the rupee has occurred in recent years. It was a pretty stable currency in the 19th century. So if you apply compound interest to a stable metallic currency, you have an exponential growth in the apparent value of one rupee going back in time. So that when you take her figures for um, the different periods which I've taken from one of her tables here and I've plotted it, what you see is clearly just a negative exponential curve. Um, all you're seeing here is the mathematics of compound interest. It's nothing to do with any real economics. It's the most banal capitalist delusion that self-expansion is an innate property of money. Our conclusion to this is that Pat Knight does correctly describe an important part of the imperial exploitation of India. And this is something that's missed out in the standard Leninist analysis. But her good work on this is spoiled by arbitrary and frankly just made up 
estimates of the present value of the surplus extracted.